before we commence today's session, I would like to pose a brief question uh, to our esteemed first speaker, Dr. Kitsuri Adil Singha, consultant medical administrator, before going to his lecture. So as you have demonstrated a unique approach compared to many of your peers, in your view, how should health managers perceive the role of artificial intelligence in enhancing healthcare delivery and decision-making process? How they can ensure patient safety with improved diagnosis and use of AI? Uh, Good evening to everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yes, sir, we can hear you. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm. Um, uh, what I'm going to do here, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you all uh, giving the opportunity to share our thoughts uh, in this particular uh, discipline. And um, uh, patient care and safety uh, service care, and there's a different uh, equipment at the altogether. So in my presentation, I thought of I thought of giving you some insights uh, on this. Uh, if you look at the uh, typical uh, uh, patient care and safety, uh, the uh, fundamental uh, acumen is that we have to really look at uh, what is safety. Uh, are we, however, current systems are doing well? Are they doing well? Uh, is there a reporting system that we have? If you go to any hospital or our health system, there's zero uh, medical mishaps uh, until it goes to the different levels of investigation. Uh, we have zero uh, reporting system on, uh, especially in clinical uh, errors. Uh, we do have public system uh, with a lot of clinical uh, different ways of information system, which is extremely good in South Asia. But in terms of curative care, there's more to uh, improve. Uh, fundamentally, uh, we, we, we should really look at um, uh, the whole idea here is to make sure that you don't make a mistake again. We are all humans. The uh, healthcare workers are working in a very frugal environment, minimal resources, etc. And then uh, everyone knows what it is, uh, especially in South Asia and all over the world. Uh, it, it is important to make sure we identify our uh, patient healthcare risks and then reporting it and then making sure it is more visible. In the first fall, it is called uh, open disclosure in a particular unit and then goes to a system of uh, curative care uh, system. We do have uh, systems uh, which is organized almost uh, after the uh, uh, from in the independence, we still use them. The high time that we could uh, look at uh, the importance of patient safety uh, in day to day life. So I will be uh, will be just expressing my uh, views uh, with the world uh, uh, information regarding uh, my presentation. Thank you. We greatly appreciate your expertise, Dr. Drisinha. Thank you very much, Vishwa. Now, let us commence this collaborative effort into the world of artificial intelligence. Our first speaker for the day is Dr. Kitsiri Edrisinha. Dr. Kitsiri Edrisinha is a distinguished consultant medical administrator with both government and private sector experience. Dr. Edrisinha is also a project consultant for many local and international healthcare service development projects. He is also an international researcher and also a resource person for many healthcare organizations around the globe. Dr. Edrisinha is an innovative leader showcasing his prowess in a quantitative research, strategic management, quality and risk management, as well as legal and ethical skills. With over 25 years of experience in healthcare administration and more than two decades in the field of education, he stands out as a seasoned professional. A trailblazer in the introduction of innovative and technologically driven holistic healthcare education, Dr. Edir Singh has played a pivotal role in providing internationally recognized qualifications to South Asian students. Currently, he is on a mission to transform 
IIHS Multiversity into the premier healthcare hub in the South Asia, further cementing his legacy as a visionary in the healthcare and education sectors. He will be sharing his valuable insights on the utility of artificial intelligence in healthcare, health managers' perceptions and insights. Sir, the audience is yours. Uh, thank you, Vishwa. I'll try to um, share my presentation. I have a small presentation. Uh, thereafter, we, we should be able to uh, talk about it more. Uh, can you see my presentation? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, okay, lovely. All right. Um, uh, my topic today is to give you a brief on uh, use of uh, artificial intelligence, the opportunities and the challenges, and the medical administrator's perception, uh, how we could really look at how to use AI in a most uh, pragmatic way. Um, that's why we talk about what is AI. Uh, everyone knows, but I want to give uh, my perception as an administrator, how we look at more simplistic way. And then uh, challenges in using AI and opportunities that are on table. And of course, the medical administrator's view. Uh, looking at the introduction, if you really look at what uh, artificial intelligence means, is that if you look at uh, uh, it's always positive anyway. Uh, artificial intelligence is not a substitute to for human intelligence. It is a tool to amplify human creativity and ingenu ingenuity. Artificial intelligence is not a tool, but not a threat. That is that is a first uh, note that I want to make here. Let's look at uh, how we can look at this. Um, we all uh, work with data. So what is data? When people talk about data, data, raw numbers. So how many patients come to OPD? How many patients you treated? How many vaccines given? So then it becomes, we said, put these things to in an orderly manner, it becomes information, right? Organized numbers of data. That makes sense to us. Otherwise, just data. I know uh, we in, in uh, most of the time we, we, we collect data uh, continuously without looking at what's the purpose of that data. So once you create the data, you set, put it set, set up uh, uh, in, a, in a more meaningful way, it becomes in, in information. So we do IMMR, everyone knows, uh, and then we do every daily public health, private sector, government sector, people ask for information. That is a set of data you put into a system that people make sense. What is intelligence? The adding experience of that data, if you see a pattern, you always look at, then you look at giving uh, some decision, some, uh, or your opinion to make a decision. Now, why it is called um, CIA, Central Intelligence Bureau, FBI. So always intelligence comes in because there's a human factor. They look at information and try to predict what is going to happen or monitor and see there is an experience coming into it. So that is intelligence. So AI is the it's a digital computer who would do that for us, who would see the patterns and come out. Uh, it could be a, by a robot or, or the robot to perform what the humans are doing. Then, so what are the things that, uh, that include in artificial intelligence? There are machine learning where the, you, you just, they just, just, look at different uh, patterns and they talk about it. And the neural networks, uh, natural language processing, robotics. I'm going to go in, I'm not going to go here, go into more details of technical data. I just want to give you a feel of how you can understand what AI is. So in, in, a, in, a, in a basic sense, what AI does, we have loads of loads of data we collect. So what we do is, now there are patterns that is happening how many patients that they come and then what time and what are the patients who come to OPD and which areas, what are the ages. So that would come every day to our table. And then what the computer would do, they, there's a thing called algorithms. Algorithms are the, they would understand the patterns, uh, patterns. And that is already, you created that patterns to make a decision. 
So how many doctors we have to put next year? Or are we having enough doctors? Are we having enough tables to look after patients? In simplistic, in a simplistic way, that's what we are trying to do. Then, so then once you get those data, we can perform a task. We do perform tasks based on those. So the decisions that we have to do, next stage would be doing clinical, performing a task uh, in healthcare, especially. Then finally, then finally it would support, AI would support for us to make a solve a problem, day-to-day -day problem. So in nutshell, uh, really look at, when you look at AI or any in other information matters, you have to understand the, what is coming from. You have uh, loads of data. You use that data in order to make a decision. So you need not to get to, into all the data that you're coming in. So the if, when you give the uh, proper instruction to computer, they would give the, the software or the algorithms. They would make sure that what you need would come in in order to make a decision. Going into uh, different types of uh, AI, uh, basically you are looking at uh, the first one, a reactive AI. It's a, it's a most basic type of AI uh, where you, uh, you, you program to provide a predictable out output based on the input receipt. The reactive machines always do the same thing over and over again. They can't pray. They can look at it and then create a uh, give you more information regarding it. They just produce data. What it is? If you give a understanding of, they react to what is the data set that they get, and they, they will give you information. But the second thing is limited memory AI. Limited memory AI learns from the past. They learn from the past and builds a. Uh, the, the experiential knowledge by right, from those data. Now, if you look at your, your you're using your phone, uh, automatically you put a name like Kitsuri Adirisinga, odd name and long name. But automatically, if you send several messages, messages you have to pick up that and all limited, limited, very limited. But they would come up and then you pay KE, they would come up with my name. So you must have, under, you must have experienced this before. The third area is theory of minded AI. So it is somewhat more than what you are getting now. It's more meaningful conversation with the emotionally intelligent ones. Like, you know, so many. I mean, uh, Apple has uh, the uh, uh, most of the software and the mobile phones. You can talk to a person and get it in. So most of the four, uh, if you go get into uh, a, a European vehicle, uh, or some of the modern vehicle, they would ask, "Can I? what can I do for you? So you give a conversation, you give instruction, they will start doing that. Then the uh, most important thing is um, the uh, self-aware of AI. The most advanced type of intelligence, it's a self-aware of AI. When machines can be aware of their own emotions, they will start doing more than what you need. So they, they can do, give, uh, there's a consciousness kind of develop within AI, and then um, it's very intelligent. That's the bottom line, the, the highest level of AI. And you just talking to someone, not only talking to someone, they will give Im information, about, allow you to make decisions. Um, so in the overall uh, opportunities in using AI in healthcare, uh, amazing, amazing opportunities we have. So the Australians, uh, US, uh, Europeans are doing wonderfully well in this. So um, it is not only a, just a healthcare, it's uh, spread across social care, et cetera, which is around healthcare. So um, not just a, a basic information that you get that would make your life much, much easier and the life of a patient much uh, better. And in terms of patient safety, this will come on the forefront. Um, so what are the things that you can do with AI? So it will support your healthcare intervention, the clinical areas, uh, and support transforming patient outcomes. Uh, what is the prediction that you can give? Uh, a patient comes to you, you prescribe a drug, drug or they do a medical intervention. What is the prediction that you can give um, that they can go home? They don't go home or have disability. In one in four, Patients in uh, any system 
has a, a probability of getting through uh, uh, probably undergoing uh, medical mishap. Uh, that's a research data shows. So how can you transform in patient data? And the quality, when you talk about quality, then the safety automatically will come in. Not only a technical quality, doing a procedure, but the service quality also improves. That's the patient perception of uh, the healthcare. And you can predict diseases. Uh, if you give the basic data to the uh, AI, they will predict how many patients would come in next year, et cetera, et cetera. That is a main dilemma of dilemma or dilemma of health administrators, how to re allocate our resources for next year. How many machines that we have to use, how many laboratory tests that we have to do, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then most important thing here, that would give you personalized medicine. Because now currently what we do, we take about 10 stones and throw at patients. And we generalize the patient's uh, diseases. So what, what happens in here is that you can, when you know exactly, if you get the genotype, genetic profile, and the disease patterns, and all that put together, you can predict diseases. So that's a personalized medicine. Uh, when it comes to healthcare research, you can accelerate the research process and of course the drug discovery. We all know what we had during COVID. How can you get a, a vaccine in about two, 18 months time? It was not at all possible if not for uh, AI and of course the existing research. Uh, healthcare education, especially in using our, our area, biomedical education, the delivery assessment and clinical training could be uh, done through AI. I'll talk about it in a while. Public health, the surveillance, the, what's the disease patterns, disaster management, prediction of disasters, health promotions, and mostly it all to do with the predictions. So we have a set, uh, it is, healthcare is uh, more vulnerable for economic, social, environmental, and other factors rather than just the hu typical human factors. So therefore, it's important, uttermost important as administrators and healthcare managers for us to predict what is going to come. Uh, going into uh, more users, so diagnosis and prediction, the, it would uh, definitely enhance the diagnostics. So AI algorithms will definitely analyze the medical images. It is happening now. Uh, some of the jobs that we have will go out of the window because the AI would do those jobs. And the radiologist who have been reading this, and we were waiting for that radiology report to come in, would uh, could do something more than that. So there's the interventional radiography, uh, radiology would come in. And uh, predictive analytics, uh, how can you predict the likelihood diseases based on the information that you have? So there are a few things, I'm not going to go into more details on this, how AI could do, though you can, for example, simplistic example, you get imaging, then you have a uh, look at any 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 diseases that the patient's having, then you have a, a segmentation of that, and then extract each individual patients, and then identification of the AI techniques and say diagnose what their patients is having. Um, similarly, post-operative care. Uh, drug development and testing, virtual assistance, medical imaging, uh, and different ther therapies than what you are using now. Risk screening, treatment response prediction, and the prognosis evaluation. So it comes in very handy in a in a uh, healthcare risk management. Uh, there are many things that we do um, for patients, how they do things, and then of course the, the, there's a massive set of data that the information that we collect in healthcare. How can we use that for day-to-day -day stuff? You know, we all you know, in, uh, especially in South Asia, we have been asked to uh, give information. So we send information continuously. And that is, uh, if you really look at uh, South Asia, about 30% of our time used in filling forms and giving data, etc. How can you, how can we use that data for the betterment of day-to-day -day what we do? Um, look at uh, personalized medicine. Uh, you can have tailored treatment uh, for, for from the genetics and etc. 
and drug development also that will be very helpful you can fast track it um, moving on to um, operational efficiency that is day to day stuff that we do the, there's an administrative automation we can the data can be utilized for us to so uh, to make decisions so otherwise the human factor would come in we all know we have a problem in having humans in work because we don't have uh, healthcare is very scarce uh, healthcare resources especially human resource we don't do much production uh, not many people want to come to healthcare uh, except the doctors others they look at as a downgraded uh, profession but uh, the doctors will contribute only 30% of the healthcare but the 70% is from coming from the others so um, how can you use existing resources to the uh, maximum use resource optimization um, so they, they would look at relieving what the existing people are working, replacing unnecessary work, uh, splitting up uh, certain uh, roles that we do, and augment. That's a nice word to use. You know, we all know augmenting. When the amoxicillin came, we started augmenting. So people don't like change in South Asia. Uh, you can augment what they are doing. If you say we are going to change this role, they would uh, resist. But the good thing is, no, no, no. We will support you to augment what you are doing. Augmentation is a improving. Uh, you can improve the day-to-day -day life of a healthcare professional. Um, there are so many things that I mentioned. It is all there. And then if you look at the patient care per se, uh, look at the patient, there could be a virtual assistant. They are even uh, chatbots. They call chatbots, uh, robot called chatbox. They can talk to the patient and then virtual assistant and their support. Um, many countries, including Sri Lanka, I was part of the team to uh, create a chatbot uh, during COVID time. Unfortunately, uh, we, we did the whole uh, software, but due to the administrative uh, inefficiency, we couldn't implement it. Uh, the political, inter not because it's administrative, it's a political call. Uh, you could uh, use the data when you what we did was we there was a uh, human resource bot who used to interview patients we use that bot uh, to uh, when you want to talk to a doctor when you are in a bad state so what we did was uh, there's a massive input coming from the patients covid so what we did was we created this uh, augmented this particular uh, hr software where to uh, when uh, looking at the breathing uh, looking at the uh, eye movements and then other factors, there was fewer variables. We could see whether that bot could uh, divert that particular information to a uh, to a uh, doctor or a healthcare professional. This is much much before we start isolations. So therefore, um, that's that's one of the case studies that I would uh, like to uh, uh, emphasize here. And then uh, now we can use that. Uh, assistant. Everyone wants to assist them. If, if you are sick, if you are older, aged, you need somebody to talk to. There are remote monitoring. There are wearables. You can wear at any time. I've got a thund thundering surprise. I'm not in a clinical area now, but uh, my uh, perception of a pulse oximeter of a big unit, which is, uh, I myself was instrumental when I work, uh, work in the clinical areas, about 20 uh, yeah, 20, uh, maybe about 25 years ago. Now, uh, when I wanted to have a small pulse oximeter uh, to take home, uh, then I was given a small, like a box of matches, you know, small play thing to put it in. I was got a shock. So it, the wearables have come, become an amazing tool where we can monitor patients from far away, including, so we have to use these uh, technologies and put into where the uh, the way most the problems are, then use that. Um, so whether they are at the hospital uh, or the peripheries or wherever, you can use them and then make decisions. Uh, critical decision support. So we uh, uh, humans are we have a great brain. We have hundred billion brain cells, which is equal to the Milky Way stars in the Milky Way in the space. So we have, but unfortunately, we have not been using this brain much. We are using about 10% or 15%, maybe. Neuroscientists would say otherwise. So um, how with the other, other work, 
uh, uh, with the other pressure coming in, it's nice to have a, a decision aids around you. But that would take uh, uh, loads of data, clinical data, and for you to make a decision. That's a that's an important area what you can look at. And treatment optimize, optimization. So analyze what is the best treatment for that particular session, patient. So that is another area. Um, and then systematic choice, you can look, look at the whole system once you do that. Going into health records and data management. So we collect enormous amount of data continuously and we have a thing called a medical record department. I was working uh, long years ago, the year 2000, uh, at uh, Ragama Hospital, teaching hospital as a deputy director. So I was put into this the record department because I did not have a place to stay. Um, so I started looking at this enormous amount of um, physical data, what you had, and there was always people collect them and write IMMR. Um, so I created a small, I, I knew only Excel sheets at that time, hardly any. So I created a small, simple system where the medical record uh, uh, officers, uh, they could uh, uh, filter from the, we did not have funky uh, softwares at that time, uh, but we used that and we started giving because uh, for a patient to a uh, person to get a uh, birth certificate, issue a birth certificate, it was taking about a month. So we did it in about 10 minutes. That was the first thing that I got involved personally in clinical care in Sri Lanka. Uh, so that's data integration. And then, uh, of course, looking at the different languages and how we can get those things to uh, one simple language for us. Uh, those are the things that you can use. Um, um, then next, next thing would be looking at the medical research. Uh, I spoke about in a while ago, uh, the pattern of recognition of uh, correlations. So very important to have correlations in medical research. That's what we do in medical research anyway. We look at different patterns and we try to correlate them and come into a conclusion. So that would do by that could be substituted or augmented, not substituted, but augmented by uh, a bot. Uh, literature review, you no, know, enormous amount of literature review. If you go to uh, fingertips, uh, when I did my master's in year 2000, uh, I, I had to really go through physical data. If you want to, we had to go to PGIM uh, to get into uh, PubMed. That is an enormous task getting there and doing that at that time. But now, of course, it's a fingertip. They call information a ubiquitous, that is, at the fingertips. So now, how can you use this data? What do you want to do, the literature review, et cetera? And you know, people who use chat GP, uh, some would traditional, be, the traditional professionals would say it's, a, it's a, not a good thing to do. But we would say otherwise, uh, recently, my team I published uh, how to use chat GP in a positive way. Uh, uh, so they said we have to see positively how to use AI for this. So there are many things that you can do, pattern, statistical pattern, synactic pattern, and then uh, natural uh, or neural patterns of recognition. So different types are coming in, many things to look at it. Uh, finally, if you look at healthcare, uh, education, so simple things that I, my experience is using learner management systems, XR hubs, high fidelity simulations. We all know healthcare education is a tough one, regulated one. We don't have enough uh, educators. We don't have enough critical preceptors. We don't have enough clinical uh, uh, opportunities for to give the maximum competency for patients, our, our staff or trainees. So if you use technology, you can make sure the healthcare education more safe because they have seen, you can show them that's the particular uh, intervention or you can simulate that. Uh, they Sometimes they might not see it. the first MI patient during their work, I'm just I'm saying, or some fit, so you can simulate that. So create the safe uh, practice of this training of these uh, 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 trainees and then complex scenarios are hardly seen by seen. Now, for example, as a student, uh, you hardly see even a medical student. Uh, you, sometimes you might not get that opportunity because you have so many people looking after the patient and uh, accessible to that particular scenario. And then uh, you 
get the feed confidence. Once you see a patient, and like the tiger coming into that particular village, you know, like when you see it once, you know exactly what to do. My experience in clinicals, my first patient uh, at, uh, that is uh, 1990, uh, my uh, Abhisavela Hospital, the first MI patient that I got, um, it was very difficult for me to find the patient. So the patient came with about 12 other drunkard men and women. So I had uh, difficulty of finding the patient. I found the patient ultimately. So got the patient into that. I had a clinical protocol, basic protocol, one. Protocol, 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 protocol. So all that could be done. So I did everything what they can do. Uh, and then uh, finally, I found that uh, giving oxygen was a problem. When I tried to give oxygen, the the key to put the oxygen cylinder has been taken or taken uh, put in into a cupboard and locked by the uh, nurse in charge. So I had to run to another ward. It's a marathon run to get a key to open. That is my experience. So next day, next week, I had a key done by a lathe machine operator, and I had in my key tag. This is my experience. So. This, how can you make our trainees confident of scenarios without making, that's the other thing. And standardization of training could be easily done because clinical training evaluations are very, uh, uh, you can't, uh, it's uh, intangible. So I might look at these good, if somebody would say that is not good. So you can standardize the clinical training and most important thing, getting the feedback from the training. So that all that could be done using technology in healthcare. Just to give you a brief on uh, uh, learn, using learner management systems in healthcare. So there's many things you can do. It's a paperless delivery. You can deliver all what you want to do, recorded lectures, whatever, synchronized, etc. Assessments could be done. Now what we do is all MCQs, we physically do it uh, because we wanted to make sure that we adhere to standards. But Automatically, it's uh, marked, etc. Even we go into uh, assignments could be marked online, submitted online. Structured essay could be a uh, Now we are doing it now. It be measured by a bot, trained bot. Uh, one of the things that in healthcare, in education, uh, when you do a, let's say you do a MCQ, uh, you can be biased. Uh, but if you if you have a bank a MCQ bank, you can give the different. Uh, 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 a structured validity for different topics, then the bot would pick up uh, until you come in the morning, even the coordinator does not know or the dean does not know what is going to happen, what the paper would look at. And when you try to implement it, you can't copy because every uh, MCQ is jumbled by the bot. So therefore, there are a lot of uh, uh, clarity coming in and unbiased and uh, high quality examination could be done. Uh, for us, if you do 1,000 nurses to be trained, we are, uh, we are basically uh, saving about 100 million rupees. So that's why we have been becoming a, a very affordable uh, health, uh, training. What we do is because using of healthcare. This is only the direct cost. There are more, if you really calculate, there are indirect costs, the, the traveling, et cetera, et cetera, for this. Um, going to XR education. XR is uh, making clinical training very cost effective and accessible, but creating a highly competent and critical thinking people. When you do a physical training uh, of a procedure, you become a working person. But when you use XR, though you can create a scenarios where you start thinking healthcare professional. So external reality is a it's a it's a, like a combination of uh, the augmented reality, you can uh, augment the, what is happening in the virtual area, the virtual reality and mixed reality. So somewhere there in uh, HR, it is uh, uh, people who are playing games would know what I'm talking about, but it's, a, it's an amazing tool uh, that you can use. Um, uh, if you look at XR, you can use for patient assessments, uh, surgery simulations, before you actually do the surgery, uh, situational training, uh, uh, have a, a different scenarios. Uh, you can, basic sciences, you can do. You need not to have a, a body to dissect and spend more time and find a body, a body, et cetera. You can do all that in the basic sciences. 
uh, and prolonged exposure of therapy. Now, there are traumatic conditions uh, you can definitely <clears throat> use when you go to a hospital to, as a trainee, we know how many, most of the people would undergo uh, distress in getting trained. Some people give up. You can stop that, reduce that. And of course, a global burning space. So we have a, a, a scenario uh, where we get a patient, we, uh, three universities, international universities, uh, hand over the patient, or nursing patient. So they take the patient, ultimately the patient dies, but uh, we hand over, we do, we do it for a day or two, then hand over to England, that goes to Finland. So it's a global patient that changes all the time. So all that can be done and you can learn from them what, what's going to next. Um, so this is one of the areas that you can look at. And uh, in terms of the uh, cost reduction, 40% of the uh, consumables that, uh, that are used in general training can be reduced. 66% of the teaching hours from lecturers involvement can be reduced enormous amount of this thing. So that would, that would support us to get enough uh, train enough because what world if you take uh, nursing they need about 13 million nurses now it says in the 10 minutes 10 months 10 years time uh, you need about 23 million nurses it's an enormous amount of we don't have the capacity to develop how can you do get there and fill that gap and then uh, different simulations 80% uh, of clinical exposure can be created before though they go into a clinical environment and about 94 Scenario. We do this now. Going into high fidelity simulations, uh, you have we had just mannequins. We use uh, our time. Uh, we use only our. We did not have mannequins in uh, thirty years ago. We use our own friends to uh, do simulations. Now, then came the mannequins. Now we have high fidelity mannequins who would talk and create a scenario. You can change all that enormous amount of potential. I'm talking about my area, what area that I'm concentrating of, but the other areas, there are enough simulations. Um, finally, there are many opportunities to use uh, AI in healthcare if you use it wisely. And uh, the challenges would be uh, resisting uh, AI. Because if you can use your phone uh, to do day-to-day -day activities, that's the first thing to do, then you can use it in healthcare. Many challenges are there. Uh, we don't have enough technology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, you can access the technological companies to support you. Uh, then how can you use uh, more? Uh, initially, when a software comes, it's expensive. After a while, it's, it's not expensive. You can use different ways of doing it. And mostly, main thing is, how can you convince the traditional thinkers to use this? Uh, how can you allow these regulatory bodies uh, to use this as a, an entity to support this particular problem? Everyone knows. We don't produce enough people. Everyone knows there's a scarcity. Patients are suffering. Our, our healthcare systems are overloaded with patients uh, because we don't have enough people. How can you produce more people with this AI would the one that would support us? Finally, medical administrator perception is that first we have to get our kitchen ready. We can't cook for others if we don't cook for our home, home people. So get your. how can you get your before you even think of AI and et cetera. We have to relook at our processes, day-to-day -day processes that we are doing. What is the input of patient that we are coming? What are the functions that we do? So what is the output and probably the outcome? Initially, if you can look at output, it's called process analysis. That has to be done even before thinking of anything. That's And then once you do that, if you look at the past data, you know, exactly what are the problematic area. Maybe the name, uh, people say Kiribanda and Sudubanda. Those two can be bandas. So you make, may, Banda can go to a theater and you take a orchidectomy on a patient who has a wound care, wound uh, cleaning. Where the other fellow, only when he comes in there only, you have a, you try to do a wound care, wound, uh, treat, uh, wound uh, cleansing, and you identify he's not an orchidectomy man. That's the simplest thing, example that I can tell you. Likewise, we, we can really look at our processes first and I uh, apply these uh, processes, these uh, uh, health and care safety, safety onto those areas which we had uh, previously. 
And then secondly, you can look at predicting what are the areas that can come in. Then you can look at this. And then, then you go into AI and look at what are the areas you want to improve. What are the areas that you need support of technology uh, manually, but you are really, you have an issue. And then uh, first thing I would say, start mobile, go to your mobile and see what are the AI apps that you have available. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adrisenya, for that enlightening presentation. Your insights into the potential and challenges of AI in healthcare management were truly illuminating. Now, um, we have. Uh, if you have any questions regarding that, uh, it's your time. Okay, uh, if you have any questions, you can put it in the chat. So thank you, Dr. Adrisen, once again uh, for your excellent presentation. And we appreciate your time and express.